Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I realize. I realize thank, you, uh, thank all of you for coming in. Uh, <laughs> Mary, could you come down here? <laughs> hey, guys! <laughs> it's a little bit like hurting cats. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my lecture today is going to be focusing on spike timing. And uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, one little thread of going on in my lab for the last 10 years or so that's beginning to make uh, contact that has to influence uh, a, a lot of other areas of research, not, not just my lab, but other labs, which I think is going to make the next 10 years really exciting. Um, and just, just to give you a little sense of uh, why spike timing might be important, uh, this is uh, result from uh, Mumi Hu's lab, and uh, similar spike time dependent plasticity has been found throughout the, the cerebral cortex, the superior folliculus. Uh, it, it's different in magnitude and in the, the uh, time window, but the key observation is that the relative timing of the spike in the pre and post synaptic neuron is, is very important for determining whether the neuron will, uh, the strength of the synapse, the EPSC, will increase in amplitude or decrease in amplitude uh, <clears throat> depending on which comes first. So the relative timing and a window here of only uh, plus or minus 20 milliseconds makes all the difference in the world. And there's a knife edge here between uh, pre before post and post before pre of only a few milliseconds that uh, determines the sign. So what that suggests is that if in fact this is used in the central nervous system to uh, determine whether or not you increase or decrease the strength of a synaptic weight, it means that there must be very tight control over the relative of, of the timing of, of uh, spikes in different neurons. But this is orthogonal to the issue of representation, right? Representation of, say, uh, earlier we heard about uh, visual features, how they represent it. Uh, most people believe it's uh, the average firing rate, the total number of spikes. Well, this is another dimension. What do we want to use these spike times for? And one of the things that we use for is co controlling the, uh, what, what information that is flowing through the circuit will get committed to long-term memory. And uh, one of the subtexts of Jeff's talk this morning was that uh, correlations between spikes, for example, in a pair of cortical neurons that have long-range horizontal connections might be very important for coding the relative uh, for, for, for uh, encoding constraints between those units that are representing different features. Okay, so the, the starting point is uh, an experiment that Zach Maiden did when he was a graduate student at my lab, he's now at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab, uh, in which uh, in vitro, recording from visual cortex of rats, he injected current using two different waveforms. The traditional one that's used by biophysicists is, uh, of course, a nice square pulse uh, because it's easy to analyze. And in this case, uh, he injected that 50 times, and each one of these uh, lines represents a single uh, experiment, a single trial, and the ticks represents the time that a single action potential occurred. And, uh, and as you can see, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, projected down in terms of a histogram with one millisecond bins, this is over one second. Uh, the first spike is very accurate in terms of when it occurs after the onset of the stimulus, and the second spike is pretty accurate too, but after that it gets broader and broader, and eventually all the information recorded in the initial uh, onset is washed out. And, uh, and of course this is the uh, traditional view that uh, only the average prior turnover spikes over some moderately long time span, 200 milliseconds, is really what carries the information. However, things look quite different if instead of injecting this square pulse, you inject a fluctuating current pulse, which after all is what you measure and record intracellularly from a cortical neuron in vivo when an animal is actually seeing things and, 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 and performing. Uh, the only time you ever get a membrane potential neuron that looks like this is when the animal is dead or in a slice where the neuron is dying very slowly. 
And it's a consequence of the bombardment of excitatory inhibitory inputs from other spontaneously active neurons. So even in the absence of sensory inputs, this is what we measure. And now if you take this, which is what we call frozen noise, right? This, this waveform is repeated literally over and over again now, 50 times. Here's the uh, raster and here's the histogram. You can see that, uh, in fact, almost all of these uh, spikes, even in the latter part of the uh, signals, can occur at a very uh, precise time. In fact, the precision with which the spike occurs, if you look, if you look this up, is on the order of a millisecond. And it depends on the properties of the stimulus, the amplitude and fluctuations here, uh, plus or minus five millimeters, the actual current of what producing the energy potentials on that order. And yeah, high frequency contact is also something to maintain high precision. And there's also a question of reliability, which is the area under each of these peaks. Uh, and that tells you how many, which percentage of the time it actually spiked at that, at that moment. So what I want to do is to explore that a little bit. The first question we're going to ask is whether this is an artifact of slice or whether it's something that actually occurs in vivo. And so uh, uh, there was a paper that came out a few years ago, uh, 2002, uh, by Ken Reidegel, who's now at UCSD and Clay Reeves, in which they uh, did the same uh, experiment, but now in vivo on a cat, recording extracellularly from the uh, lyrogenic nucleus of the cat while there was whole field quicker. And here's the stimulus changing uh, intensity as a function of time over 500. Uh, <coughs> this, this is actually over two and a half seconds. So this is a very um, long record. And uh, which, 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 what's shown here is uh, just taking two of these and 128 uh, trials uh, from two different neurons. You can see that there's very precise timing. Uh, again, on the order of a few milliseconds. And what's really remarkable is that these are from two different cells, and in fact, cells from different animals. So, you know, it, it shows that the precision of timing in the LGN, which is about at least uh, like three synapses away from the photoreceptor, can be as precise as it is in the slice. Now, you notice that uh, different cells have different average firing rates. Well, that, the corresponds to is the fact that uh, some of these spikes drop out at the lower firing rates. But when the spike occurs, it will always occur at a time that it also occurs at the higher firing rate. So this has to do with uh, the, the timing seems to be somehow intrinsic to the actual signal. Not every, uh, for example, uh, peak here is represented, but when the configuration when the stimulus is, is optimal for producing a response, it will do it reliably as long as the cell is near uh, the threshold. So that's, that's good because it tells us that at least uh, we, we have a, a timing signal that is preserved that far. The only question is uh, how reliable is it, it really is it? And this is where we started exploring, going back to in vitro experiments, we started exploring some of the parameters of the signal, for example, the frequency level. So let's see what happens when we give it a nice uh, sine wave, right? This is a better control signal than the noise because we know exactly what the properties are in the area of frequency and the altitude. And here's an example of a response to uh, signals that was chosen to give a nice reliable response, as you can see here, for the first second or two. But then it starts becoming unreliable. That's because there are adaptation currents within the cell itself. It's changing the properties of cell's response is changing over time in response to the properties of the signals. Now, you might think, if you just look at this, that, well, OK, so it becomes unreliable. Uh, you know, can't really respond maybe on every peak. But it becomes clear exactly what, what's happening when we separate this out. Let's cluster these, these uh, individual trials into two groups. And we did this by hand. And uh, the cluster, uh, here's the uh, original trials. Here's the same trials, exactly the same, reproduced but not clustered into two groups. And you can begin to see now that there, there's two actually populations here. It's hidden away. Your eye can't see this, but hidden away in this mixture is two separate and very highly reliable patterns. One pattern on the even sine waves and the other pattern on the odd sine waves. And that has to do with the fact that uh, as it adapts, uh, depending on whether it catches the even or the odd, it will be able to continue to follow every other. And, uh, but once it gets on that track, it stays on the track. Right? This is kind of like tractor dynamics. And what this also suggests, and here's, here's the real 
conceptual leap that, 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 at least for us, made a big difference was to stop thinking about individual spikes and individual events and start thinking about patterns in time, temporal patterns that are tied together, spikes that are tied together. So if you want to get on this track, you continue on in a certain uh, way to respond differently than if you got on to the uh, input on the other track. And it could be a very small little perturbation, some noise that drew you on one or the other. But once you're on the track, you're in it. So this, uh, <clears throat> because of the fact that it wasn't obvious by looking at the raster, uh, how to, you know, w whether there are any hidden patterns, we uh, uh, developed, and this is work that was done by John Mark Canu and, and others in my lab, uh, developed uh, a clustering algorithm for doing it automatically. So here's some survey data that we created. Uh, it was, uh, we, we put in artificial events, and first we generated some Poisson spike trains. We put in artificial events where we uh, put a spike in and we controlled the amount of jitter, uh, in some cases, with their missing spikes, in some cases, we put in extra spikes. Uh, and the question was, uh, how, do, uh, how do you separate out uh, three different, different uh, patterns? We took this, this is one pattern, this is C2. We put in another pattern here, C1 and C3. Shuffle them up, and here's what we're starting with. And the question is, can we recover these uh, different clusters? There's the histogram, and you can see it peaks pick out the times of the spikes, but it's not at all clear how these different peaks are, are fitting together into patterns. So here's the, uh, the algorithm. And it was developed uh, with uh, Suzanne Schreiber, who's now in Berlin, and Paul Tiesinger, who's now at uh, Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina. So first of all, we just take the raw trials that are, are uh, right in the chapel. And we consider the uh, times uh, as, a, as, a, as a vector. Uh, we actually first convolve it with uh, a narrow Gaussian with a few millisecond window. And we, we take the dot product of all those vectors. So the 150 vectors, here's the dot product. White is one, and the diagonal here, not too surprising, is one because it's exactly uh, the normalized one. And uh, off the angle, you can see that there is some structure here, but uh, it's, it's kind of uh, washed out. So we go through a couple of pre-processing steps. First step is to do some histogram equalization so that uh, it broadens the, the white and the black. And then we apply uh, uh, a, a version of uh, K-means clustering to get this into a block diagonal form. And once we have the order, we can now read, uh, uh, order them so that uh, Patterns come up here. So this is this is the overall pattern clustering. So let's try uh, to see what it works on some real. Uh, so this is a somewhat more complicated pattern than a simple sine wave. It's a, it's, it's a mixture of two sine waves, one at six hertz and one at forty hertz mixed together. And you can see that it's the two. So we injected this into the cell in vitro. This is actually the previous work that we cell around. Injected this current. 150 times. And here's the raster histogram. And what I'm going to show you, as you can see, there's these nice, uh, reliable, uh, and precise events. What I'm going to do is to blow up these two boxes. This one has three events in it. This one has just like one broad event. So let's look at a compared temporal resolution. Here it is. This is the one on the left that has uh, three events in it. Uh, and some noise. Here's one that's resolved into two events with some noise. And now we apply the shuffle, uh, our, our uh, <coughs> clustering algorithm to see whether or not we can find subpatterns. So here's the subpattern that pops out of the automatic procedure. It turns out that if you reorder this, you can, you can find that there are actually two different patterns. And that uh, here's the actual stimulus that produced all of them. If you're in pattern A, you acquire at this time and this time, but not in between, except for some noisy cases here. If you acquire a little bit earlier, then you won't acquire at that time. Again, a little bit of noise. But you will acquire twice on these two peaks. And so, uh, so and interestingly enough, if you happen to be in this sub-pattern, you can predict that you're going to be in it a lot earlier, because the, it's predicted by the first spike that occurs here 200 milliseconds earlier. So there's some kind of history going on here. If the cell has some history, it, it will send it down one track, and a couple hundred milliseconds later, it will respond differently to the pattern, to whatever the stimulus is at that time. Right. What about the, uh, the second 
group here. Well, this actually very nicely cleanly separates into two very uh, distinct kinds. These, these are not uh, noisy at all, depending on which cluster you get in, you have a pretty precise uh, event. Now, there was another data set that was taken, which is, I think, even more remarkable. This was an uh, experiment that was done in Tom Albright's lab next door to mine at the Salk Institute. It was instigated by Tony Zador, and it, it, was, uh, it, it, it was recordings from the Monkey uh, MT, which now was like 10 cent acid removed from the photo sectors. Uh, and Vidius uh, uh, Barakas and uh, Mike Ruiz, who uh, teamed up together to design the stimulus. The stimulus consists of, of a uh, gradient, a little bore, that uh, is that is, is that mean uh, five minutes again. Uh, that is uh, fluctuating randomly back and forth between the preferred direction and the anti preferred direction. So here's the, uh, the time course. And this is a little bit like a flick rate stimulus. In other words, this is a cell that preferred that fires at a high rate and preferred direction. And actually, it's a pivot of the anti preferred direction relative to its uh, that based on the rate. So here's the visual stimulus. Here's the rasters. And what they concluded from this is that, in fact, uh, even in NT, you can get very precise spike timing. Here, the, the width is about 5 milliseconds. It's a little bit broader, but still 5 milliseconds is really quite good. But it's not as reliable. They concluded that, look, uh, there are some events in which you have 90% uh, you know, of, the, of the trials will have a spike at that time, but there are others who are only like 25% or 30%. So precise, but not reliable. So we, we got a hold of the data set, and we applied our clustering over. Here's the uh, some of the data at uh, higher temporal resolution, 64 trials. What I'm going to show you on the next uh, <coughs> slide is a blow up of region one and another one of region two. And this is uh, one second, so we're talking here about one to 200 millisecond windows. Here's the, uh, the blow up. And you can see here that there are probably two events. It's not at all clear if there are any events in two, but that's now our clustering algorithm. Lo and behold, there are actually three clusters for this group. And they're quite, again, they're not only precise, but reliable. If, if it's going to go on this track, it fires at this time. If it's on this track, it fires at this time. If it's on this track, it won't fire at all. What about two, where it's not obvious there's anything going we'll on? Well, it turns out there are five different clusters corresponding to five different, four different times that they can fire or not. So what this is telling us is that really, that this is really quite extraordinary that, uh, that there's different patterns with which MT neurons can respond reliably and precisely to the same stimulus. What about Pam Wright's data? Let's go back and take a look at that. And again, we're very fortunate that they allow us to look at the raw data. If we, we take, well, for example, one of these cells where there's 100 trials and apply the clustering algorithm, Here's an example of some of the cells, 80 trials, very precise. You can see that uh, this extends for two seconds. They actually have up to eight seconds of recordings for um, each of these trials. We clustered on the first 350 milliseconds, and here's what we found. We found that there were two clusters, cluster one and cluster two. The first spike here of cluster two occurred a few milliseconds, five or ten milliseconds before the first cluster, cluster one. And if you get on this track, you are on that track in the next eight seconds. So there are examples here of, of this one here is a reliable spike in cluster one, no spike in cluster two, and there's the converse. Here's uh, let's see if I can find one. A reliable spike in cluster two and one or a few in uh, cluster in cluster one. So uh, there's another in, uh, peculiarity here, which is that it's possible to go for uh, about 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, and actually fire at the same time that you get a spike in cluster one. But then there's some memory that you're in cluster two because it reverts back and continues along that path. So uh, what does this mean? I see I'm running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I don't have enough time to tell you what games. <laughs> <laughs> but there are two classes of questions one can ask. Question number one, why is this, what's happening? 
Is this a property of cells that are, are different under different conditions when they get into one of these tracks? By physically, what is it? Is it current that's changed? Is it a network property? We don't know. That's an interesting biophysical question. But the other interesting question is, what implications does it have for network behavior? What implications does it have for spike time dependent plasticity? What, and, and what implications does it have for regulating the flow of information between neurons in different cortical areas? If they're um, under some circumstances uh, firing with one, one highly reliably with one pattern, that will have a very different impact downstream on, on the neurons in the next year. So these are two areas, two different questions that we're actively pursuing. And here are some of the people who helped with this project. I've already introduced that and you'll mark that there are many others who have made important contributions. Thank you.